Hello, welcome to the EPG Pathshala program in linguistics. I am Pramod Pandey, Professor, Center for Linguistics, Jawaharlal Nehru University. I am the principal investigator of this project. Today we are going to listen to a discussion of a module from the course Advanced Phonology. The coordinator of the course is uh, myself, and the title of the module is Optimality Theory and Introduction. Listen to the presentation of this module. In the present module, we present an introduction to a non-derivational generative theory known as optimality theory, the dominant theory of phonology today. It briefly discusses the main points of difference between two main approaches in generative phonology, namely the derivational approach and the non-derivational approach. The derivational or classical generative phonology was propounded in the sound pattern of English and its sub-theories such as autosegmental phonology and metrical phonology. The non-derivational approach in generative phonology is presented in optimality theory, or OT. For the benefit of Indian students, we also briefly discuss some of the notions in the Indian grammatical tradition to which the critical notions of OT are related in order to show the strength of OT. Derivational generative phonology. The starting point of optimality theory is the model of standard generative phonology. The model is reproduced below for the sake of ease of reference, since we have already discussed this. Look at it on the screen. As we notice, the classical model of generative phonology has two levels of representation the underlying representation and the surface phonetic representation, or simply surface representation for short. The two levels of representation are related to each other by means of a series of rules. Rule 1, 2, say rule n. And these rules are sequentially ordered in relation to each other. The following features characterize the classical generative model. A. The goal of the theory was to develop an explicit phonology that generates all and only the surface forms of a language. B. In order to generate the forms of a language, phonology employs derivational means, that is, sequential processual analyses, with the device of phonological rules. C. The theory assumes that phonological rules are ordered in relation to one another, the ordering being consistent with the data. Now let's take a look at the derivation of the plural allomorphs of the regular plural morpheme in English and see how the derivation takes place here. The plural allomorph, as you are already familiar, Allomorphs are is, the, and sir. The is the underlying form, and sir and is are the additional surface forms. Now, let's look at the derivations of the regular forms on the screen. Now, two rules are involved in the derivation of the plural forms, namely E insertion and D voicing. Let's consider the ordering amongst these. Suppose we order D voicing first and E insertion later. If we do this, then we will find that the middle form buses cannot be in the output. Instead, the unacceptable form buses will appear because the will have been devoiced. If you don't want that, if you don't want buses, but as buses, then we have to order the e-insertion rule before devoicing. 
Now the interaction between these two rules then, which is E insertion devoicing, leads to the correct output forms. The point about the interaction is that the interaction among phonological rules in the grammar helps express generalizations in a simple way. Optimality theory. Now, optimality theory or OT differs from derivational generative phonology in the following main assumptions, among others. One, the relation between the underlying forms and the surface forms is mediated by phonological constraints, not rules. Two, the phonological constraints are universal constraints and they are ranked in the grammar. Three, the universal phonological constraints apply simultaneously and not sequentially. Thus, OT does away with the notions of rules and the other properties of grammar associated with rules, such as rule ordering. In derivational generative phonology, there is provision for both rules and constraints. Let's take a look at some of the well-known constraints in generative phonology. As you see them on the screen, the maximal onset principle, which says intervocally consonants are maximally assigned to the onsets of syllables in conformity with universal and language specific conditions. So if there is a single consonant between two vowels, it goes as the onset, not as the quota, following this principle. The second constraint, obligatory contour principle. It says adjacent identical elements are prohibited. So identical sounds are best avoided. Then the no crossing, crossing constraint, which says association lines do not cross. Now you are familiar with all these constraints discussed in the previous modules on metrical phonology and autosegmental phonology. Note that the no cons crossing constraint alone is inviolable, but the other constraints, maximal onset principle and obligatory contour principle, are violated, as you will notice from the module, the examples given in there. Now, why are universal constraints violated? The violation of the constraints is warranted by the fact that although more than one form can emerge from a single input form, only one of them is selected as the output form. So the one output form violates all those constraints that allow the other possible but rejected forms. Since one of the output forms is selected among other possible forms, one of the constraints must be the strongest and ranked highest while the others may be violated and are ranked lower. Notice that grammars differ on account of the ranking among constraints in them. The notion of ranking of the constraints in a specific grammar is of critical importance. Thus grammars differ because the constraints in them are ranked differently. How is the alternation among the plural allomorphs that we saw, namely sir, sir, and is, how are these accounted for in OT? Now, OT assumes that the following universal constraints apply in grammar and on the plural morphy. Constraint 1. Sequences of strident sounds are disallowed within a syllable. So two sounds such as sir, sh, or sir, ch, etc. are not allowed. And these are both strided sounds. The second, sequences of obstruents within a syllable must agree in voicing. So if there are obstruents such as plosives, 
of fricatives or affricates, then, and if they occur adjacently, then they must be both either voiceless or voiced. Now, if you look at the way these constraints are stated, notice at the start that they are always stated in capitals. Now, what does uh, eight do? As we noted, it prohibits the sequence of two strident sounds. And eight B prohibits a sequence of two obstruents that don't agree in voicing. We find that actually these can be easily be violated. For example, in Hindi, you have a violation of the no strident plus strident sequence, such as ashcharya. So sh and ch both are stridents and yet they occur adjacently. And the Hindi variety of Indian English has the pronunciation of the word bags as bags often a frequently heard pronunciation. And here, g and s are obstruents and yet they don't agree in voicing. Now let's see how a grammar in OT works. A grammar in OT has three components. These are known as gen, con, and eval, short forms for longer words such as generator, constraint, evaluator, etc. The component gen gives rise to an infinite number of possible output forms. As you can see on the screen, Given the word B I R D in English, you come across various pronunciations, some of which are given there. Bird, 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 etc. There are also somewhat most unlikely forms such as bark and bank. We assume that gen can generate any number of forms. The second component is con. The unlimited number of output forms are subject to the application of constraints stored in a constraint set con. So you have constraint 1, constraint 2, constraint n. And the third component is eval which chooses the optimal candidate based on the evaluation of the rankings in the grammar. So the optimal candidate is one which does not violate an output that is the most important constraint. Sorry. Again. Eval chooses the optimal candidate based on the evaluation of the constant rankings in the grammar. The optimal candidate is one which does not violate the constraint that is ranked the highest. Now, based on the constraint rankings, we have different pronunciations as you see them on the screen. American English, British English, Hindi English, Malayali English, etc. What we find is that no variety exists that pronounces that word as bark or as bank and we wonder why not because these will not be allowed. These will be totally ruled out by the constraint. And one of the things that we want to do here is to understand why not. Now, as compared to the above conception of constraints in OT, where any number of constraints can apply to the outputs of an input form, derivational models, that is, only those phonological rules apply that meet the structural description of a rule and not the entire set of rules. Besides, rules but not constraints create the impression that the generalizations are accidental properties and not predicted by the grammar. In OT, the outputs are predicted by the grammar. The constraints are ranked in such a way that only an optimal output will emerge and not any other.
Conflict Among Constraints From the earliest time in grammatical theory, conflict among linguistic rules and principles has been a subject matter of critical concern. Within the Indian grammatical tradition, the origins are traceable to Panini's phonetic treatise known as Panini as Shiksha. It's also known with other names such as Naradiya Siksha or Yadurveda Siksha. Now let's turn to take a look at some of the couplets from the Siksha texts that are regarding the need to guard against lapses in rendering Vedic texts. So the first one, it says, Madhuryam Akshara Vyakti Padas Chedas Tu Suswara Dhairyam Laya Smartham Cha Sadeite Pathke Guna. The couplet beginning with Madhuryam Akshara, which is translated as sweetness, clearness, separation of words, right accent, patience, and ability to observe time are six merits in the recitation of Veda. And let's turn to the other couplet beginning with Upamshu, translated as, one should not recite a Vedic passage in undertone between one's teeth or quickly or haltingly or slowly with a hoarse voice in a sing-song manner with repressed voice omitting occasionally words and syllables and in a plaintive voice. Now, <clears throat> thus the Siksha texts are concerned about rendering the Vedic texts by preserving them in the standard form and recognizing the need to guard against the natural articulatory tendencies for change in the forms. So both the tendencies exist. One, to pronounce the forms in an easy way, lax way, and the other is to keep the texts close to the original text. The elsewhere condition or Panini's theorem. In Panini's grammar, the Ashtadhyay, the issue of conflict emerges as a significant issue on account of the applicability of two rules, a general rule and a more specific rule. The general rules are ordered early on, while the specific rules are ordered later on. Panini states this as a general principle, vipratishede param karyam. In the situation of a conflict, apply the latter. That means that when there is a conflict between two rules, the one which applies first, that's the general rule. And the one which applies later, that is the more specific rule, the later rule must apply first. Now, this particular principle was stated as the elsewhere condition by Kiparsky. And you see it stated on the screen. Rules A, B, in the same component applies disjunctively to a form if and only if one the structural description of a the special rule properly includes the structural description of b the general rule and the result of applying a to the form is distinct from the result of applying b to it in that case a is applied first and if it takes effect then b is not applied now, one of the simplest examples of the universality of the application of the elsewhere condition is the precedence of irregular affixation over regular affixation. For instance, in English, the formation of irregular plurals such as mice, data, oxen, men, from the singular mouse, datum, oxen, man, must precede the formation of regular plurals such as houses car and cars, because if that doesn't happen, then the irregular forms will never exist, they will be lost. The elsewhere condition has been renamed as Panini's theorem in optimality theory. 
in McCarthy and Prinn's work, in accordance with the revised conception of grammars consisting of constraints rather than rules, mediating the input and the output levels of linguistic forms. Panini's theorem determines the higher ranking of more specific constraints over more general constraints applying to an output. It's interesting to note that the issue of conflict between principles and rules was thought of constituting not only grammar, but also linguistic capacity in general in the work of Wilhelm von Humboldt at the beginning of modern linguistics. Look at the following statements from von Humboldt. All individual languages belong together. All their particular characteristics, however different from one another, come together in man's capacity for language. This capacity is the central point in the study of language. Language can be compared to an enormous web in which each part stands in a more or less clearly recognizable relationship with the next one, and all of them are likewise related to the whole. Humboldt was of the view that a language is driven by two forces, for the force of inertia and the force of energia, that lend it the character of a system which is in constant change. Ferdinand. So if you have listened to the introduction to optimality theory, as we try to discuss, optimality theory is a radical change from the derivational theory of generative phonology. We tried to see how some of the basic assumptions of optimality theory actually have roots in our own Indian grammatical tradition. Optimality theory is one of the most dominant theories of phonology. I hope you'll be able to read the important modules on the subject that are coming and try to do the exercises in them to be able to gain familiarity with the theory, which is so well known today and which is being practiced by most phonologists. Thank you.